This is a true story of how a group of students hijacked a Japanese airlines using samurai swords, which was the first hijacking case in Japanese history. In the midst of all the chaos, the students believed that their plan was working. But little did they know that the Japanese authorities with the help of the CIA have devised a plan so clever, you would think it would only happen in the movies. What was their motive? How did the authorities outwit them? And how did they escape? So keep on watching as this true story will surely blow your mind. MTV Facts. Yeah. March 31, 1970, 7.33 a.m. Japan Airlines Flight 351 is flying from Tokyo Haneda Airport, its destination, Fukuoka City, which is just an hour away. The aircraft's name was Yodo, carrying 122 passengers and seven crew members. Many of the passengers of Flight 351 are Japanese citizens. There were doctors, businessmen, university students, and a couple of tourists. But there were also a few notable passengers inside the flight, like an American Pepsi executive, a Roman Catholic priest, and a bassist from a famous rock band in Japan. In the first few minutes of the flight, the situation was normal. All seemed well. Yet unknown to the passengers and crew members, they were going to experience a nightmare that will haunt them for the rest of their lives. Twenty minutes into the flight, a youth stood up and went to the front of the aircraft. The youth's name was Takaro Tamiya, 27 years old, and he caught their attention by declaring their intention to hijack the aircraft. He drew a katana, a sword so sharp and keen normally used by samurai warriors that instilled fear into the hearts of the passengers. The other passengers shouted and panic set in. To avoid this situation, the rest of Tamiya's crew stood up and told the passengers to sit down and keep quiet if they don't want to be killed by them. Their fear was magnified due to the fact that not only did they carry katanas, but also guns and a few homemade pipe bombs. The hijackers were composed of students aged 16 to 27 years old from two of the most prestigious universities in Japan, Kyoto University and Tokyo University. In addition, the passengers were even more shocked when the well-known bass player Moriaki Wakabayashi also stood up, and it was then they realized that he was also conspiring with the other hijackers. In total, there were seven hijackers, and in their hands laid the fate and lives of the passengers of Flight 351, which was now under their control. Now you may be wondering, how did these young people manage to smuggle these dangerous items inside the airport? A good question. It's because airport security in Japanese airports during the 1970s were not as strict due to the fact that there was no case of hijacking in Japan back then, and so making it easy for the hijackers to evade airport security. Tamiya then commanded the rest of his crew to tie up all the male passengers to their seats. Afterwards, he forcibly broke into the cockpit to tell the pilots that they were hijacking the aircraft. The pilots immediately sent a distress signal and called for help using their radios. However, Tamiya was able to enter the cockpit and pointed the tip of his katana at the captain and first officer. Because of the katana sword pointed at their necks, the pilots were unable to do anything other than follow the orders of the hijackers. It was then that Tamiya told them to fly towards Havana, Cuba, in order to meet and join the group of the famous communist rebel leader Fidel Castro. The university students, the bass player Wakabayashi, and their leader Tamiya were members of the Japanese Red Army faction. The group was known as a communist movement that sought to overthrow the Japanese government and start a world revolution. But before they could achieve their goal, they wanted to train under the leadership of Fidel Castro and thus wanted to go to Cuba in order to be recruited. And after their training, according to Tamiya, they would go back to Japan in order to start their rebellion against the government to start the revolution. Unfortunately, they hijacked the wrong flight, because Flight 351 used the Boeing 727, a passenger aircraft designed for short-ranged flights. In addition, the pilots told them that the fuel they had was not enough to fly to Cuba, since it was only enough to fly to Fukuoka City, their original destination. Because of this admission, Tamiya turned still. A few moments later, he accepted their answer and allowed them to land on their original destination, with another plan in mind to get to their goal. Meanwhile, news of the hijacking reached the ears of Japanese officials. The news spread fast throughout the country, and the media focused on the issue because it was the first time a hijacking took place inside an airplane within Japanese borders.
Japan's vice chairman of the Ministry of Transport that time, Shinjiro Yamamura was the one assigned to handle the matter. When the plane landed in Fukuoka, the authorities quickly surrounded the aircraft. Then a long negotiation took place between Yamamura and Tamiya. Both sides didn't agree on the other's demands, and it reached the point where Tamiya threatened to kill all the passengers inside the aircraft if the authorities did not yield to their demands. In the end, both sides reached an agreement, and so Tamiya's group would release 23 passengers, composed of children, women, and the elderly, in exchange for fuel for their aircraft. After the two sides have done their part, Tamiya changed his plans. Instead of flying to Cuba, he and his crew decided to fly to Pyongyang, North Korea. This is because North Korea is a communist country sharing the same ideology as they did. The leader of North Korea back then was Kim Il-sung, the grandfather of North Korea's current leader, Kim Jong-un. The Japanese authorities did not agree to the hijacker's decision to fly the aircraft towards North Korea because it would put the passengers in harm's way. Because of North Korea's strict regulations, and without giving prior notice that the plane is going to land at Pyongyang, there was a chance that the North Korean Air Force would shoot down the airplane they were flying. Despite the danger, the Japanese authorities were unable to do anything but to accept the hijackers' demands. The hijackers gave the pilots a map from the authorities of the airport that would guide them to Pyongyang. The pilots were a bit nervous because this was the first time they would fly towards the North Korean capital, and when they saw the map that was given to them, they were dismayed to find that the map is just a line map taken from a book, which meant that even if it was reversed, it is useless in making a decision. But the paper would become the key that would save the passengers and crew from the hands of the hijackers. Meanwhile, a few hours passed, and they are nearing the border separating South Korea and North Korea, known as the most dangerous and heavily guarded border in the world. Try to enter without permission, and it is guaranteed that the North Korean soldiers guarding the border will shower you with bullets. When they got close enough, the pilots tried to contact the North Korean airport controllers but did not receive any answer. Because of this, the pilots warned Tamiya on the possible harm they would encounter if they entered Pyongyang airspace. But Tamiya was determined, and he was not afraid of the country because they shared the same ideology and beliefs with North Korea. He was also ready to recruit Kim Il-sung into the Japanese Red Army faction if needed. A while later, they spotted two North Korean fighter jets and were immediately fired upon. But the firing did not last and eventually stopped. Everybody on the plane breathed a sigh of relief. Then they received a call from the North Korean airport control. The pilots quickly explained their situation and told them that the hijackers shared the same ideology and belief with them. And although it was a complicated affair when you thought about it, the North Koreans accepted the pilots' explanation and allowed them to enter their stronghold in Pyongyang. It was noticeable that there were a lot of small and big North Korean flags displayed around the airport. They were also greeted by civilians carrying placards welcoming Tamiya and his group. The communist hijackers were very happy with what they witnessed, and they could finally achieve their goal. Unknown to Tamiya and his group, this was merely part of Japan's rescue mission plan. On the other side, they were ready to. But they were not the only ones. South Korea and the Central Intelligence Agency, or CIA, of the United States were also involved. Because aside from the Japanese passengers, there were also two American citizens inside Flight 351, so the Americans decided to cooperate with the rescue operation. And South Korea was concerned with the fate of the passengers if they would continue their planned arrival in Pyongyang and also decided to cooperate. But did you remember the map given to the pilots a while ago? At first glance, it seemed it was useless, but there was a small message hidden at the back with instructions to land the plane at South Korea. This meant that the hijackers were deceived and made them believe that they were going to North Korea, when in truth, they landed Flight 351 at Ginpo Airport, South Korea. Also, the jet fighters that fired upon them were not from the North Korean Air Force, but actually South Korean Air Force. The action was merely part of their plan in deceiving the hijackers. Also, when Flight 351 was in flight, the South Korean government ordered the authorities to renovate the surroundings of the airport so that it would resemble the North Korean International Airport. Even the acting of the youth choir, the greeting soldiers, and the welcoming civilians were merely a part of the plan in deceiving the communist hijackers. 
It was one clean plan and execution done by Japan, South Korea, and United States here. However, that was what they thought. Tamiya noticed that they were not in North Korea. First, he did not see any picture of Kim Il-sung spread out around the airport. Another thing was that he saw an American airline, an American car, and an American soldier. Whatever the reason was, it was clear that the rescue plan of Japan, South Korea, and the United States failed, proof that Tamiya was wise and not easily deceived. Because of this, Shinjiro Yamamura, head of the Ministry of Transport, was forced to contact the North Korean authorities to explain their situation as well as to get their cooperation. The North Korean authorities accepted and promised that they would let the airplane fly after accepting Tamiya and his group. But South Korean leader Park Chung-hee was against this approach because, according to him, he knew how cruel and evil North Korea was. In fact, he was the target of assassinations by North Korea multiple times for the past two years. In the end, they allowed the hijackers to release the hostages, but in exchange, the vice minister of transport, Shinjiro Yamamura, will become their hostage. So the civilian hostages were set free, and the vice minister accompanied the hijackers to North Korea as leverage against Japan. It was 7.21 p.m. on April 3, 1970, when the aircraft landed on a small airstrip in Pyongyang. When the hijackers exited the plane, the pilots immediately flew the plane back to South Korea with Shinjiro Yamamura. Tamiya and his crew succeeded in their goal. They were warmly welcomed by North Korea, but they were not allowed to go to Cuba. The North Korean authorities taught them Juche ideology, an ideology created by Kim Il-sung, and afterwards were made into North Korean operatives. They were given a luxurious life by Kim Il-sung. When they requested women from Japan to become their wives, he didn't think twice and North Korea recruited women. But this was the start of the group's conflict because there were some members who liked the same women, and you know what happens when two men fight for a woman. Tamiya's group was known as Yodo 9, taken from the name of the airplane they hijacked. Some of them were forced to serve as spies and were assigned missions to different countries using fake names. It was also known later that Tamiya was not the original leader of the group, but Takaya Shiomi. However, he didn't board the plane and instead gave the orders to the leader from his hideout in Japan. After the Japanese authorities discovered the connection between Shiomi and the hijackers, they immediately arrested and imprisoned him for 20 years. The rest of the members, like Yasuhiro Shibata and Yoshimo Tanaka, were reportedly arrested and imprisoned after a couple of years. The remaining members of Yodo 9 requested the North Korean government to allow them to return home to Japan and had to serve time in jail.